Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to tonight's podcast. Only uh, five minutes of technical difficulties. New record today. Just kidding. Um, so I'd like to introduce my guests right off the bat, and we're just going to go in order. So Paula, first and foremost, go ahead and introduce yourself. Give us your promos, all that fun stuff. Who are you? What you do? All that fun stuff. I'm Paula M. Kramer. I am an international best-selling author. I am an inter- international professional speaker. I'm an international TV producer, and I'm a soft skills mastermind. And my focus is on helping people recognize stereotypes in their lives. Most people don't have any idea how many stereotypes they face every day. And to use soft skill strategies to limit the stereotypes or break the stereotypes. I have two online courses, and I have 14 blog posts providing resources for you to use soft skill strategies with yourself. Because too many people think they don't deserve success. Sweet. And where can we find you? What's a, what's a good uh, place to pick up? Softskillstrategycourses.com. Easy peasy. That's where the easy. courses are. That's where the blog posts are. And I offer three free lessons from my courses so you could learn valuable ways to succeed in the world and to protect yourself. Fantastic. All right. Moving over to our other guest, Kathy. Catherine. Sorry. Don't mind me. It's all right. It's all right. Sometimes I answer to hey, you too, depending on what situation it is. So <laughs> you, might get a couple, you might get a couple of those tonight. It's one of those kind of nights. It, 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 it's all good. It's all good. Um, my name is Catherine Cartwright, and I am an editor. And part of my editing um, work actually is helping authors who don't feel like they are ready to be authors get their books ready to go. Um, I do a lot of developmental content editing. I do some copy editing. I don't always do the proofreading part um, because if I've already done the other two parts, then I'm totally too familiar with the book and then I'm missing the proofreading side of things. So um, generally I suggest somebody else do that part or they just run it through Word or one of the other programs like Grammarly or um auto crit and they'll be able to have that beautiful proofreading happen besides me doing it so (laughs) that's that's my thing um i do also help people relax into their writing um by helping them figure out where their soul message really is and what their soul is really trying to get them to write because sometimes what they think they're writing is not what they are writing for their soul to really be happy. And then it's all stiff and and hard to get out. Like if you're in the flow with your soul, then it just flows on the page and otherwise it doesn't. So the key is for me to help Mm -hmm. everybody get their message out because everybody has a story. And maybe Mm -hmm. it's not one that's gonna be published, but everybody has a story. You're doing similar things. Yes, yes, we are. You are are teaching people to trust themselves, which is using soft skills with themselves in a different way. Exactly. Exactly. So before we get too much further, where can they find you? At writeeditshare.com. Writeeditshare.com. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. You guys' guys' websites are great. I love it. So we're going to get right into this, and we're going to talk about tonight's topic. And The topic tonight is imposter! Dealing with... uh, how to deal with imposter syndrome slash what is being creative, right? And I think you two are two excellent guests for this topic. The other two that we we're going to have this week would have also been fantastic at it, but unfortunately they had last minute schedules, so it's just the three of us. Wah, ha, ha. Eventually Younger should be here. To my knowledge, that or he's fighting cows. I'm not sure which. We'll figure that out later. Um, so we're going to again just go into questions, and we're actually going to start with the uh, what is creative part. So in your own words, what would you describe Or how do you describe things as creative? Or what ticks that box that, hey, that's a creative thing to see. So we'll start with Paula since she's got a inline here. Creative thing to say, is that what you're asking? Yeah, so like if you see something, right, and you Mm -hmm. look at it, what pings that little twitch in the back of your head that's like, ah, that's creative? Oh, let me think. I just was at a dinner tonight and someone said, 
really creative thing. I, it, she said something so creative. I asked her for her career involved words and she it didn't. Let me see. Oh. Oh, it's not gonna come. I should have written it down. <laughs> It was a creative use of words to describe someone. So I can't remember that, so we're going to move on. Creative is something that surprises a little. Okay. But she said it was a little bit of a surprise, a pleasant surprise that gave a different perspective on something. Nice. Okay. I like that. That's a, that's a good uh, definition. Jumping, jumping over uh, Catherine. Yeah, for me, creative is all about that soul coming out. Um, so creative is this happy, bubbly spark that comes when you're writing or painting or making music or creating the solution for some engineering problem you have or or just simply it's just everything. But it starts with that really deep, bubbly feeling. At least for me, it's a bubbly feeling. One of my children says it's more like a a warm feeling. So, but it, but deep inside you, you just it it's that bubbly warm feeling that that you're like, aha, this is this is what I needed right in this moment, which could be just about anything. So, kind of a silly question, but would you guys both agree that uh, being creative breeds motivation? Yes, I would. I, I yeah. mean, as, as as humans, we should be motivated by what sparks joy in us and, and our creativity is human. I would say that being creative, it's a motivation to try something different. Mm. If you surprise yourself with create your creativity, then you can be motivated to try something different. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, can you be creatively lazy? I mean, that that's kind of a, a tangential question to that one. Can you be creatively lazy or, or still be creative and be lazy? Yes. yes. I have a treehouse that is actually more for adults than for kids. It's only three feet off the ground and it's huge. <laughs> I can go sit in my treehouse and... and Accomplish all kinds of things inside me and outside of me in my treehouse. <laughs> Just sit there and sometimes I play the kazoo though, so that's not quite. <laughs> hey, you know, what if I yeah. get the juices flowing, right? Yeah, <laughs> right. Creatively, yes. In fact, once I go out to my treehouse at night, I like going out there at night. It's underneath a huge cedar tree. And I discovered that if I go outside after it has rained, little drops of water sit on the branches, on the cedar leaf branches. And so I can take a photograph of those water on the branches and get all these little sparkles against darkness. <laughs> so that came from being lazy and going out to meet my treehouse for a little while. I got these wonderful photographs. That's awesome. That's a, that's a, that's a fun experience, to say the least. Catherine, what about you? Where, where do you where do you feel on the question? I I honestly I believe you have to be lazy in order to be creative, because okay. in our very hectic, busy online all the time, phones pinging and binging, and and there is nothing like laying on your back, looking up at the clouds, and seeing what shapes they make. There is nothing, but much like Paula, the the beautiful picture she took, you know, I mean, like, like our brains need to have downtime in order to actually let the creativity come out. I, so right. I, I am fully, I'm fully on board with being, I don't consider it lazy. I consider it being instead of doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I need being time to be creative. I don't know. I know the most of the time that I get creative is when I don't want to do something. Um, so it is, it is, a. Uh an avoidance tactic 99% of the time. I mean, obviously there's fun and enjoyment and all that fun stuff too. But like, if I get really creative, it's really because I don't want to do something else. 
what do you guys feel on that? Is that is that kind of in line or is it a little bit different than how you guys deal with your creativity? It's just another way to be lazy to on the way to being creative. There's different ways of being lazy, just like there are all different kinds of ways to do anything. There are different ways of being lazy and we should each look for the ways that suit us. My laziness is going out to my treehouse. Yours is avoiding a job and what, says, whatever I don't want to do uh, right, is lying in the grass. Note that we both chose nature. We both chose being out in nature. That makes sense. So um, let's see. I mean, kind of, again, tangential question because you guys are kind of jumping into it. Um, what is some, some form that you self-recognize with uh, your own creative process mm -hmm. what's something that's like as soon as you do this thing it's like you know you've got your juices but we talked about kazoo and going out in the uh the treehouse but is there other situations where you're like if i sit down and read 10 pages of a book i'm going to start writing notes or something like that oh no for me it's just sitting down and writing mm -hmm. i just sit down and write i write writing is one of the first things i do every single day because if i write then i satisfy a need in myself and the rest of the day is easier interesting okay that's it that's it that's a cool way to go about it i i actually do the same thing my morning starts off um so part of what i've recognized and and this goes back to the nature part again too is that um every person has some location that has elements that help them relax and because they're able to relax then the soul creativity comes out a little bit more. So like Paula and I are both all about nature, but Paula's might be more of the air and she needs, Paula might like mountaintops and the tree house and, you know, like having more airflow. For mm -hmm. me, I like having campfires because I can't have campfires. My morning routine is I light a candle and I sit down and write because that is when I have not had so much coming at me all day that my soul actually can like come out on the piece of paper. Um, one of my, one of my children is, is very much into water. And so for any writing assignment, she goes and sits where, where we can, she can hear the water running or can see the water. Like lake writing is her favorite thing to do because she's surrounded by water. She'll go sit at the end of a dock and, and the writing flows at that point. Whereas if she's sitting in a classroom, the writing doesn't flow. Right. So I think it all, you know, I think it's, it's all, it all depends on who you are in some aspects, but I do think, you know, there is something to be said that you, you, try to do the creativity before you start having everything ping at you all day. Because I think that's, that's the, that's the break between creativity and doing. Gotcha. Okay. Because so, you have to do. <laughs> okay. I mean, so would you guys say that like, there's an order to creative, the creative process, like, like there is a, an actuation, it might be customized to each person who's doing it. But finding the steps you need to take to get to that creative process or the creative uh, flow state, whatever you want to call it, uh, would you agree that there's like a layered pattern to it for most people? Well, since I'm not most people, for me, it's just sitting down and writing. There's no layer. I just okay. sit down and write. I, I start writing. I, I have different things I work on every day. I write, I keep a journal. I've been keeping a journal since 1981. So I write in my journal, not the journaling kind of thing with feelings. I just write about my day. And then I write, I work on a book I'm making out, out of five years of my journal. I go through a little bit of that. The next thing I work on is my TV show. I have a TV show. And so I work on that a little bit. And then I then I am doing research for a book I'm revising. So that's the next thing. So I there's not layers to me starting anything. There's just an order in which I do them. Okay. Interesting. So you're you are just the, the take actions immediately. There's no build up to it. It is just right. you're doing this, you're no doing this, up. you're doing this. Okay. That's that's good to know. Um 
What about you, Catherine? Actually, I think um, I do have. So I'm I'm gonna say, I try to write first thing in the morning because that's before I have my children needing things or I'm. But I'm also gonna say before children, three a.m. was my writing time. I literally would wake up and and it would be a natural thing. I would wake up at like two thirty in the morning and I would write from two thirty until five. Or, or, and, and then I take a nap before I got up to go to work or so, so I do believe that some people have a very much different rhythm. Um, I, with having children and they have a school schedule, I tend to stick to their scheduled needs, but when we're on vacation, I revert back to my, I'll take an afternoon nap and be up, you know, from three to five doing my creative time. So I think it really depends on trying to find that right time for you as to when you are the most creative. I always thought for me, the reason three to five worked really well was the rest of the world was quiet. I was just about to say that because uh, that's, that's when I make music and other things too. You know what I mean? When I'm in my typing 4 billion things on the computer, it's everyone else is asleep. I don't have any other things going on. It is silent in my world besides the music I'm playing. Um, so like totally get that. Totally agree. But I am also very much a night owl. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not uh, the awkward, uh, morning albatross person where I was like, eh, <laughs> go through the day, whatever day it is, adjust schedule. I feel that, you know, kid, kids are a great example, you know, how they can, uh, cut off the times for being creative or doing other things because, you know, they need your attention, you know, as being a parent, you gotta, mm-hmm. gotta deal with the kids. You know, it's an important part of it. Um, and I don't think writers and authors and other things, uh, need to feel bad for not having that time mm-hmm. when they're, you know, doing the, doing the parent thing. Um, cause it's important, you know what I mean? Um, obviously, but, uh, mm-hmm. it's one of those things that, uh, we go into timing for being creative, right? You guys kind of, kind of started at the three o'clock. Um, it's okay to have a super late night session um, or a super early morning session when the, the world is silent. That's one of my favorite terms uh, for the feeling you get when you know everyone else is mm-hmm. to bed. Um, the world is silent and you can think or you can act, right? Um, and sometimes people get into the uh, pattern or habits or whatever you want to call it where they don't get that time because they got to go to bed with their spouse or they have work tomorrow so they need their seven hours of sleep. Um, I personally would encourage people to break that cycle once a week, something like that. Maybe not on the same day, so it's not always Fridays or my worst days ever, but something along those lines. Well, how do you guys feel about breaking that cycle? How do you guys get into figuring out when the, the right time is for you? The right time is, for me, is early. I'm a single mother because my husband died when our daughter was a baby, and when she was about seven... I read in Glamour Magazine how to cut your sleep. And I cut my sleep down to four hours a night for a number of years when she was small. I would get up at 4.30 in the morning. (laughs) I would go to sleep at 11.30, get up at 4.30 in the morning. During the day, like in the afternoon, if I sat down, I got really sleepy. But I mostly was awake, and I got a lot done from 4.30 on. When I stopped doing that, I told my daughter, when she was old enough, I told her, let me be until 7 in the morning, and then we can do anything you need. And she did that. And and then I was able to cope as a single parent. Uh, Coping when you're all by yourself is super important. I know last night my kids kept me up for all but an hour uh, between their shenanigans. Um, So... (laughs) Been there, done that, feel that wholeheartedly. Um, What about you, Catherine? Where where are you at on this? I think I think ultimately you have to try a whole bunch of different times, and and that's you know again it's such an individual thing. So as Paula is saying, when her, her morning time is truly her time, and that's a beautiful time. Yours is later in the evening or, you know, the 3 a.m. time frame, because you're more of a night owl. There are some people who find it 
perfectly great to write in the middle of the day. Like they schedule from after lunch for a couple hours to do their creative process, whatever that process ends up looking like for them. But it's really for, I have seen a lot of people do lots of trial and error. The authors I work with tend to come back and tell me, oh, well, this time worked for me and that time didn't. So it really ends up being what your own natural body rhythm is in in my viewpoint, because we're all unique and we're all individuals. And, and my, my suggestion would be to take a week that you're on vacation and find out what your natural rhythm really is. Two weeks of vacation is much better, but I'm also realistic knowing that in our world, two weeks of vacation at the same time seems to be kind of a unique thing these days where, you know, more people are only taking a week here and a week there. But by the end of day number five, your body's adjusted to what your natural rhythm is. And so you might have to get your spouse on board with you if you have kids or or if you don't have kids, if you know, if you have that significant other in your life and say, look, I really need to figure out what my natural rhythm is, because for the most part in Western society, we have been trained that nine to five or eight to five is like the normal rhythm. We ha- we start that in kindergarten. And so we have, our bodies have been trained into this cycle, which is maybe not natural for everybody. And second and third shift jobs, some people gravitate to those because that's really their rhythm versus the morning rhythm. But until you play around and try, and and I read a, I read a study that said basically, your rhythm is your rhythm until it's not your rhythm. And then you have to figure out what your rhythm is again. So different stages in your life are going to have different rhythms. Yes. Yes. Age and hormones and all that fun stuff do play a major role in how we uh, deal with ourselves throughout the day, Um, which is way too much fun, Uh, especially when it Mm -hmm. comes out of the blue and slaps you in the face with something new every once in a while. Um, So one, one funny ish question or fun question for you two before we move on to our kind of next main topic what's up do you guys have any great stories of people that you've worked with that have had a very unique creative process i have an author that um published her book a year and a half ago and her favorite time of writing was right after she did her kickboxing class. She, she'd get all that physical energy out and then it would quiet her mind enough to be able to sit down and write, which I always thought was brilliant. That's not the way I work, um, <laughs> but it's the way she worked. And and I I always appreciated the fact that she she just was like, I tried it and it was actually the best fit for me. So kickboxing and then writing <laughs> and i can't combo. think of anybody in my own life but i have heard about someone who did something similar who got themselves completely worn out physically and then could be creative it is funny how sometimes the uh the physical energy does mess with the mental side of things especially when you're trying to focus on minute details or wide open details depending on what part of the writing you're doing uh, <laughs> so the second half of our little conversation for tonight is imposter syndrome. Have you guys heard that term before? Yes. Of course. Okay. Got to gotta ask and make sure. So in, in my realm of things, imposter syndrome is a wide phenomenon and it's pretty much anywhere there's writers, right? Is uh, because as, as writers and storytellers, you know, we're going to take things that we like from other genres, other movies, other people. Uh, and meld them into our own thing. And some people fear that they get too close to the sun, uh, metaphorically speaking, or too close to another author's writing style. Um, So with that, uh, as an understanding of what the heck we're talking about, um, has has that been something that you guys personally have dealt with for your stuff, before we get on to the the people you've dealt with? I have never felt that with my writing. I have never felt the imposter syndrome in any way. I developed, I had to develop soft skill strategies as a child because I had a horrific childhood. 
My mother tried to kill me twice and was a narcissist who was emotionally abusive to everyone. So my father became a quiet alcoholic to cope with the abuse. He would go out and do his job and then come home and drink two to three quarts of beer at night to bury his feelings about <coughs> my mother's abuse. But he couldn't keep his feelings buried continuously and he would erupt into rages that could last hours or days. And in one of those rages, he accidentally, unintentionally broke my sister's arm. So I was afraid of him. I was terrified of my mother. I was afraid of my father. I had to develop soft skill strategies to make connections with adults outside of my family. The first adult who made me feel safe was my first second grade teacher. She got married and moved away in the middle of the year. And when I was 11, I said something that the principal in our Catholic elementary school, Sister Viani, liked so much that she would have me come to her office for conversations. I would sit across from her desk from her, and I don't have any idea what we talked about anymore, but I remember having a wonderful time and laughing a lot. And at age 11, I felt that I was equal to anyone. I have, from age 11 on, I have felt equal to any person in any room. And I, when I first heard the term imposter syndrome, I had to look it up because I didn't know what it meant. Hmm. Okay, well, I mean, that answers the question pretty thoroughly. How about you, Catherine? Where, are you, where do you sit on the imposter syndrome scale? I think lots of people have imposter syndrome. I'm going to be the first to say that I also have been in that imposter syndrome. Um, it's really easy to compare yourself to others. If you know, if if you have not learned the skills like Paula had to, um, you you do have to have some imposter syndrome at some point. And whether you can overcome it or not is is truly the key. So when I work with my clients, I tell them that your words and your story are coming out in the way you need to have them come out because your soul contracts are going to be the ones who find you. So I currently... Um, currently, I'm editing two books that are very, very similar in subject and in fact a lot of the concepts are exactly the same in the two books which is really interesting that they both appeared at the same time in in my editing work um but they both are told in such different ways and in different aspects that they're not going to attract the same sort of author and same sort of reader and same sort of they're they're just so different it's kind of like um it's kind of like people who love Anne McCaffrey's Pern may or may not like Christopher Pollan's Aragon, right? Because they're in two entirely different types of dragon stories. They're dragon stories. You might love dragons, but you might like how one's written and one's not. And so, so it's, it's all about whether you're willing to be brave enough to admit that your story is your story and the way you're writing it is meant for who's going to read it, not compare it to people who perhaps have also been writing for years compared to you who have been writing for a shorter period of time. I mean, I certainly would not compare my writing to somebody like say David Weber, who has been writing for you know 40 years and I've been writing for three. You know, I mean, like, like there, there's just a difference. Like if you go back and you read something that one of the authors that you love has that wrote like their original stories that haven't been updated, haven't been recreated because they could do that after 20 years because the copyright runs out and then they're, they're tinkering with their books again before they get republished. If you look back at some of those authors that wrote their early works, they are so different from the ones that they've written, you know, 10, 15 books down the line. So I would say that 
every, and in fact, every author, I think at some point does have some imposter syndrome because you're comparing yourself to these people who have been writing for much, much longer and years. And, and those books went through an editorial process and they went through, you know, they, they didn't just write the book to start out with. They wrote a draft and then they had people read it and talk about it with them and say, this is what I really love. This is what I really hated. The author then does another draft and then another draft and then another draft until they're happy with it. And then, you know, then it goes through editors or, you know, and, and advanced reader copies. And sometimes um, the advanced reader copy has comments that come back and the author is like, oh, we need to stop and pause actually publishing on time because we want to fix some of the stuff that the advanced readers have now told us because they're a bigger group of people versus the smaller group of beta readers that they've been working with. So my viewpoint is imposter syndrome is there and everybody can overcome it if they just sit and really think about the fact that they have a story and somebody needs to hear that story and that person's words because perhaps one story that was written that was very similar is not going to be able to be read by somebody who did not resonate with that particular story. That totally makes sense to me. Um, I mean, as a, as a personal antidote, uh, honestly, I'm kind of with Paul on this one. It's not something I personally have dealt with a lot of, uh, but every once in a while, one of my players will be like, wow, that really sounds like something else. And I'll realize that like, the concept is very close. Most recently, uh, we had a time wizard messing with time and doing things and so on and so forth. Uh, and we worked through his character, like just said everything this character had done over the story for the last, I don't know, couple months. And uh, he's a, he sounds exactly like a Time Lord, like from Doctor Who. Uh, made me giggle super hard, because I'm not a big Who person. But if you had just taken all his key points and the things that he'd done, that was very much a Who Whovian. Uh, ga ga what do they call him? Uh, you guys remember what the planet the Doctor's from? Starts with a G. I want to say that I have never compared my writing to anyone else, but I also base most of what I write on my own life. Since nobody else has lived my life, there's nobody to compare it to. Okay. I mean, that that's an excellent way to avoid And you guys both brought up a couple of really <laughs> good uh, top jumping off points that I'm going to jump into. But we'll start with that one because that's, that's, that's easy piece to jump into. Uh, it's much simpler to avoid imposter syndrome when you self self focus right as a writer uh if you're doing mm -hmm. stuff that is all about you and your experiences if it sounds like you are uh, uh sherlock holmes too bad you know what I mean you're the one that lived through it you're the one that did it right if there's no imposter it couldn't be mm -hmm. an imposter because you did it um right um and sometimes taking that writing and just transferring it into a character uh it can be super powerful a uh, great example james bond uh, as a as a mm -hmm. fictional character, right, was built based on a real person, but then translated into a spy novel slash movie slash all that fun stuff. Um, so that that's like a super easy mm -hmm. jumping from hey, you can take real life actions and turn them into your stories and still make them flair and exciting and all that fun stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so keeping keeping that in mind, writing for yourself or as yourself, uh, telling the stories you and then changing it to a character is a mm -hmm. super simple way to. Uh, avoid that um, imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, at least in my opinion. You guys have any thoughts or additions to that one? I I personally think that if you read any book, there's some part of the main character that is the author. So, and and I'm going to say, you know, like, and it doesn't matter whether it's nonfiction or fiction. There is some part of that book that is coming directly from the author's experiences. So like in Paula's case, she's saying she writes from her own experience, which does help with imposter syndrome and, and, and it, because you know what, there are 8 billion people on this planet ish, right? So that means that the likelihood that there's somebody else that has had similar situations is pretty common. If you think about it in that aspect, if you think about it um, in terms of you know, we we all have parts in our lives that if we're writing about it, it helps us heal. 
And so every author that's writing a fiction book, generally there's a character that they actually really relate to within that book. And that character is actually solving a problem that's happening in their real life or has happened in the past or happened to a friend or happened to a, and, and they're writing it to make it a better solution and a better ending for whatever was going on if it didn't end well in real life. So I personally think that, you know, you're, when you're writing, you are actually creating something out of your own experiences. You just don't always realize it because sometimes it's your subconscious that's getting you there and not something else. So to caveat on that one really quick, because uh, the way you said that sounds exactly like playing a character in a TTRPG, right? A lot of people, a lot of, no, not all of them are the writing people for these characters. They just play the characters and have fun, right? Um, but a lot of them are going through that internalized trauma from when they were younger or, you know, the stuff they're dealing with currently. Big bad boss is really their actual boss, uh, and they just don't realize it as they're writing him. Or how they're interacting with random characters a DM or GM has made for them. Um, so, like, there's a there's a real power in being able to play through those stories, whether it's writing it down or playing the uh, these games and you know storytelling with your friends and whatnot. Um, that is, you know, there there's a bit of a bit of you in everything you make, right? Is an easy way to put it. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you keep that in mind, you'll also step away from that imposter syndrome because you'll realize that everything you are doing is embedded from yourself, uh, and place force in front of other people. Um. And how directly it is is whatever. I, again, personal antidote: all my characters that I make are the same height as me, unless I am trying to do something funny where they are intentionally super short or super tall or something silly along those lines. Um, but uh, let's see here. Um, secondarily, you talked about writing over time uh, a little bit ago, and I think that is a super important concept. Uh, for especially beginning GMs and DMs, writers in general, um, mm -hmm. is that your writing style will evolve with you the more you do it, right? Um, Paula, I'm sure you, mm -hmm. uh, when you started your journal forever ago, it, it wasn't exactly the same, right? Uh, it's right. It wasn't. morphed and it changed wasn't. over time. Mm -hmm. um, morphed and changed over time, yes. So it, with a with a journal, with the same straightforward premise can evolve and change like if you're trying to build a complex world or even multiple worlds right because you can go in and like i like pirate books and then five years later you go pirates are dumb i'm moving on to cat people or something silly along those lines right um so uh being able to jump forward and realize that things are going to change eventually if you feel you write a character and it's just it feels like james bond right uh maybe you just need to write through your james bond time frame you find something that's a little bit more of your own footing um and uh with with that how would you guys recommend that they deal with the time thing because a lot of a lot of people have a problem with the i need a result now uh comparatively to the uh, i can wait 10 years to be an expert so how do you refocus people and let them understand it's okay to take a little bit longer like time limits and all that fun stuff are important but how do you let them know or explain to them that they are uh, able to take the time they need? Well, I have done everything in my life. Every single success in my life comes from doing something in a small space, doing a little bit of writing. The journal that I'm, I'm turning five years of my journal into a book it's the five years I spent in therapy coping with my childhood, and I had a terrible therap a therapist who really wanted to help me, but she went about it in a terrible way for two and a half years, and then I had a better therapist for the second two and a half years. And I can get through one or two a day, one or two entries, journal entries a day, and sometimes, but when it comes to therapy sessions, I can get through three sentences maybe in a day, but it's getting finished. It, there are things that you need to take time with because it's the only way to get it done in, okay. so that it becomes what you want it to be. That's, 
that's a very powerful statement. Um, mm -hmm. So, before, before I jump over to Catherine, this is Younger, this is the business partner we were talking to Mad Junk about before I got here. He's just a little late. We're gonna Man, the, the game this week threw me off entirely. I thought uh, I thought it was the opposite week. You fool. Anyway, Catherine, what about what about you? How do you refocus people on an appropriate use of their time? Slash, it's okay to take the time that you need to do what you need to do. Catherine. Um. I was listening to Paula and I actually agree with Paula. Um, when my clients are getting really frustrated, um, I remind them, and this is because, you know, I, I, I do a lot of soul writing. Like I, we talk with my clients, soul writing is really important to me. And, and I point out to them, sometimes it's divine timing that something's just not coming out quite right. And yet if you don't start and you don't do it and you don't, keep working on it little by little it's not ever going to get done and and so i sometimes suggest that they just instead of trying to start from the beginning to start in the middle start at the end like they know what the end they know what their end chapter is start there if they can't start at the beginning you know there's there's no reason you have to write necessarily in a linear fashion you can bounce all over the place and then put it together in the linear fashion. Um, I would suggest, in fact, um, <laughs> a lot of the authors that you read that have huge series, like Anne McCaffrey with The Pern or David Weber or um, CJ Share or, or Andre Norton or Piers Anthony, if you look at some of their big series and you read their first book and you read their last book in the series, you find discrepancies between what they had at the beginning of the series and at the end because they can't remember all the little details. That's their good. fans are great to point them out because their fans have totally devoured the books, right? So so their fans are going to be like, oh, but in this book you said this, but in that book you said that, right? You know, so like there's there's always going to be something and it's not going to be perfect. And if you keep trying to make it perfect, you're never going to get there because you're going to keep stopping yourself. So in my view, it's just do little bits by little bits, ask for help, reach out to people, ask friends to read what you're writing, ask, ask people in this community to read what you're writing. Because you have community out there. There are Facebook groups where you can go ask people to, you know, I mean, like, like if you really want people who don't even know you, you can go ask people out in Facebook groups that are for writers and find somebody that will actually re read what you're writing and give you some feedback on it. In fact, I would say the, the one thing that I appreciate about a Kindle Vela currently is the fact that the authors are getting instantaneous feedback on that chapter mm. by the comments that the readers are writing and then they fix the next chapter to go along with what the readers want versus what the author thought they were doing, which yeah. hopefully makes it so it's a continuity, but you know, at the end, like it flows better, but you know, I, I think that's important where you're getting the feedback from other people because it's really easy when you stay so isolated within yourself to either stop yourself or you think it's the greatest thing ever and then people read it and they're like, whoa, 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 this doesn't make sense from here to here. And and so in my viewpoint, small steps and talking to other people, asking other people for help is really critical in in that creative process. Now, the advantage- A little of, different. <laughs> a little bit, but that's okay. Um, as a yeah. as a as a as a jump off from that though, you know, TTRPGs allow for this really really simply um, because they are based in sessions, right? You have anywhere from a four hour session to a twenty hour session, or you have a session every two weeks, or however you break it up with your groups. Uh, and we, as a as a company, encourage people to have what we call an after action review. We stole that from the army, wahaha. Ha. Uh, and it's just the the good, the bad, the ugly uh, of the session, right? So things that people like things that people didn't like, things that they would have changed or would do different. Um, and as Younger knows, because we, we argue all the time at the end of sessions on how I do things or how he does things, 
um, that uh, you don't always have to take the criticisms to heart because sometimes they're just like gripes, right? And not like major issues. Mm -hmm. uh, and being able to distinguish between those two and help you redefine what you're trying to do, right? But hearing what people want, especially when you're trying to make something for a specific group of people, um, listening to what they have to say is probably the most important and powerful tool you have in your uh, toolbox of experiences. Um, knowing that someone really, really hates fighting, we'll say, slimes uh, because they freak them out allows you to not add slimes to your stories. Um, or the opposite. They love slimes. Slimes are hilarious to deal with. Add more slimes. Um, having both of those abilities to add to your writing, to your stories, uh, with other people's interaction, uh, really do curtail that imposter bit, right? Because it feels very tailored to whoever you are trying to tell the story to. Uh, younger, not to skip over you, um, but in, in, in your experience, how do you make sure that you convey to your players, to your uh, the people you're with, that they are allowed to take the time they need to do something correctly? In aspect to their character or to uh, a project or either or whatever whatever experience you're speaking there, friend. Um. So from a game side perspective, uh, I think it's a good idea to lay out the uh, the process of the turn. Like, what are the different various steps in the turn? You have your movement phase of where you can go. You have your action phase, what you can do. You know, and being able to. Uh, break it down, especially for new players who don't understand a particular system. It's much like an operating system of, uh, of a computer. Like you, there, there's a step-by-step -step guide, you know, you have to do X before you can do Y, da, 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 da. But some of those steps can be interchangeable. You might attack before you move, you might move before you attack or move, attack, and then continue moving, so on and so forth. Um, it's really along the lines of uh, helping your players know what their options are. If you see that they're stuck, uh, instead of relying strictly on like, oh, the rules here, that's be like, hey, what is it that you want to do? And um, because I'm a game master, I can tell you how you are able to do that to the best of your character's ability um, under these circumstances. So to carry off that, to jump back to the writing side of things, uh, as, as a writer, you're allowed to explain your own lore, right? Uh, again, breaking away mm -hmm. from the imposter bit is you can 100% change how something works in your writing, in your fiction, uh, to have it be applicable mm -hmm. to whatever whatever situation you need it to fit, as long as somewhere along the lines you make it make sense, right? Uh, making a joke, you know, mm -hmm. that's what the you know, the edits 20 years later are for when you re release the book and you go, ah, those potholes I forgot about that everyone pointed out for like the entirety of the book. I'll fix those now. Um, I mean, you can do that in game. You can do that uh, as you write. Um, you know, again, we, the, we have wonderful people that do the edits or people that do the pre rating um, that can kind of help with those. But just every every finished product is going to have holes. That you'll have to plug them later, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, um, it's kind of like um, play test material. A good example of this would be like I'm working I, or I worked on an alchemist class. And it started off as just simply like a rough draft of like, okay, kind of, sort of, what do I want? Let's take some historical reference, you know, read over uh, realist, uh, like historical uh, aspects of it. And then let's look at the fantasy aspects of it that you can find throughout various forms of fiction, writing, or uh, movies, so on and so forth. And then... Um, like go and create a rough draft and then you have the first draft written uh, after it's been outlined. And then uh, you go and you fit, you, you think you have everything written up and then you try to put it into a program to make it uh, have the correct art and everything else. And then you're like, ah, oh, this doesn't fit. Or, you know, you submit it to somebody else and they're like, you know, you might want to use this word instead of that word. So on and so forth. So just, um, just as a side note, do you guys, do you guys, appreciate the fact that he is saying exactly what you guys said about 10 minutes ago before he showed up. Completely. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, no, no. You just validated everything they said 10 minutes ago. It's perfect. Right, right. Uh, right. <laughs> so. so it, it, it's right? kind of funny because um, <laughs> I, at one point in my uh, military career, I was writing standard operating procedures and, you know, had a had a nice little template that was 
posted right on my wall that was like, okay, whenever I make something, I need to make sure that it's this format over here and there. Um, it was super monotonous, but, uh, you know, those skills helped, uh, helped me develop, uh, this really cool book thing that just so happens to not be in this building at the moment, sadly. Um, the, cow the cows have stolen it. Don't ask where it went. Um, <laughs> so, um, to kind of, kind of jump into the, the next bit for this, right? Um, when do you guys junk your material? Right. Again, going into the creative process, going into the imposter syndrome stuff, is there ever a line that you hit and go, OK, I, I have to trash this. This is just becoming uh, 007. This is just, you know, where does that line hit for you as a creator slash writer, so on and so forth? It doesn't. OK, that's an OK answer. I, where do you? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> no, I don't. I, which is one of the reasons I write slowly. I do think slowly is because then I get it right the first time and I don't have to dump it and start over. Okay. I mean, that's simple, right? Do, do things the right way the first time. Uh, what's the, what's the term? Uh, 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 sorry. Slow is fast, right? Uh, oh, so, right. right. If I, I will say, though, that if my perspective changes on how to do it more effectively, then I can alter the writing. I mostly write nonfiction, not right. fiction. And so I, I'm continually doing research. And if I find new research, then I'll have to add that to whatever I've been writing, especially if it really gives a, an explanatory perspective. On what I'm trying to do. Gotcha. Okay. I mean, obviously, if you find something that either disproves what you had before or explains it better, you're going to use that to amplify your writing, mm -hmm. right? Um, I mean, that's that's true in fiction as well. You know, what I mean, if you find something that works better for what you're trying to do, you can change it. Um, mm -hmm. Catherine, you you were also very adamant about not d trashing your work. Please, please uh, fill me in on what you think of that one. <laughs> I, once again, it's all for me, it's all about divine timing. So you might be writing something and it might not just be the right time mm -hmm. for it to be published. That doesn't mean that it's, or, or you feel like you're stuck and you're stuck and you're stuck. Um, I have one client that's an amazing woman. We've been working together for three years, two years, three years. It'll be three years by the time the book is actually out because she was going through a whole bunch of life experiences for her nonfiction book. And some of those life experiences totally shifted the message she was putting in her book. And then suddenly the book is flowing again because she had to have those life experiences in order to actually have that part of her book work. So I, I'm, I'm a firm believer of at some point the book works. It just might not be on your timeline. Gotcha. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so the reason I bring this up, right, is because something that uh, us, the role playing community, the TTRPG guys uh, face, especially as if they're being their own independent writer, telling their own stories, so on and so forth. If they try and publish and do other things that are more akin to a official author and things like that, uh, we hit a lot of red tape with what we can and can't use. Uh, for example, uh, a beholder, right, is owned by Wizards of the Coast, right? If you write a beholder in your works uh, and don't have their permission, you could lose your works, you know, almost instantaneously, right? Um, so, like, you, there there are ways to, you know, skirt around, hey, this is the beholder, but it's not actually a beholder um, kind of thing. Uh, but sometimes, you know, we recommend at points that it is just, like, if you get too close to the sun, step away. Don't don't pull an Icarus. You don't you don't have to fly high. You can you can modify or change it to it being a different variation. I mean, younger, you can back me up here, right? That's 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 you know when we get too close to something that we're not supposed to touch on, that's the easiest. Yeah, way to and like it. I wouldn't even say it's necessarily like D and D related. It's more like oh, let's say you're playing a space campaign in D and D, and then uh, you start using some Star Wars stuff. Um, again, that's time, where it's the <laughs> That's where they get you. So don't call it a lightsaber. Call it a call it an energy blade 
or some other BS, you know, you can like, I don't know. I feel like, um, the borderline plagiarism of ideas, like there's been people throughout all of like history, uh, people have been hitting each other with sticks the entire time. Okay. Some of those sticks are made of wood. Some of them are made of metal. Some of them are pointy things. Some of them are, some of them are blunt. Some of them are sharp, but like the end of the day, you know, things are going to be semi similar, uh, as we are all people and people come up with similar good ideas. You know, this is true. Several people have invented math. As much as we try to uh, unlearn it, it keeps coming back. Um, yeah, look at Japanese math or some some of the Asian math. It's like they count the the vertexes of lines, and you're like, why does this work? It shouldn't work, but it does. Um, <laughs> so um, I I also want to point out. Let's let's talk about Hollywood. What okay. what wasn't there one year where they had two avalanche movies that came out at the same time or two entirely different studios, two entirely different like they were filming at the same time under lock and key. Nobody knew, about, you know, so and and how many stories do we actually have that keep repeating mythology stories that have been written down that over time have shifted and and become some of the stories that we have? I mean, for goodness sake. It's not like Marvel was brand new with thinking of Thor, right? I mean, so so I do think that there is something to to be said about not doing things that are blatant, but much like the stick example, humans have been using sticks for a really long time. This is this is a great point. And to kind of wrap it back into our title, that's why you shouldn't worry about your imposter syndrome, right? That's how you deal with it. Is when you come to the realization that People have been beating each other up with sticks for pretty much our entire existence. Uh, people have also been writing about cool people that do cool things their entire existence. Um, whether it's based on fiction or reality, um, you know, nine plus billion people living currently, plus the billions of people that have come before us, you're going to hear similar stories, right? Mm -hmm. um, in an infinite universe, eventually we'll hit infinite. Uh <laughs> But with uh, with with all that kind of wrapping up and summarizing and, uh, you know, just to re-inject what is creative versus how to deal with imposter syndrome, I think the easiest way, and you guys can disagree or agree with me on your final thoughts here, uh, as long as you are being true to yourself, creative is what you make of it because it's individualized, and uh, there's no reason to worry about imposter syndrome because if you're the one creating it, it's from you. Um, as long as you're not writing down word for word what someone else wrote, like, you're good. Um, but I won't have the last say. I'm going to give that to you guys. Uh, Younger, you're going to speak last, last, besides the, the, the takeaway stuff. But uh, final thoughts. Uh, for We'll start with Paula. Well, I started thinking, when you first said that we were going to talk about imposter syndrome before we went live, I started thinking about what I could say to people who feel imposter syndrome, since I've never felt it. I think one way to approach it might be to assume that you are equal. Not to see someone as, not to feel that someone is better than you in any way, but to see that you are equal as a human being. We are all equal in humanity. And so, you walk into a room with other people and you are equal to every person in that room because we are all humans. And if you just start from that, that might help you be more sure of your equality in other ways with people. Fantastic. I like that. Catherine. Yeah. I was going to, I'm, I'm going to bring some art into this discussion since we've been talking about writers, but I think art is another brilliant way to do it. I don't think that Leonardo da Vinci learned from his painting masters that he learned from. I don't think that the techniques he learned were really plagiarism and they weren't meant to create imposter. They're part of the learning techniques. So even if you're writing in your D&D &D world, 
and using the terms that you have in your D&D world or any other fan. I'm, and I'm going to say fan fiction because fan fiction is, you know, a thing for lots of different places. Um, I, I personally think that if you have an author that you love, if you have a painter that you love and you really, or, or a musician and, and that's where you're coming up with, or, or you're an engineer and there's somebody that you think is an amazing engineer and you read everything about their technique and that's, that's learning a technique. So imposter syndrome might still be there, but yet because you're creative, you're learning a technique and then you make it your own. And I think that's really, if, if you're stuck, that's the way to look at it is, is make it your own. There's nothing wrong with mimicking somebody for a little while and then making it your own better. Solid. I like that. Younger. I love that. And the reason I love it is because I hate the end stories of Roger's campaigns. I hate how he ends them. And so I'm like, you know what? I really like a lot of this situation. But what if? What if it had a happier ending? Um, and then we move on from history as if it had that uh, that multiverse. Um, and then that might be a start point of a uh, later session of a campaign that I run. Uh, and so... I do like that turning it into your own thing, mimicking aspects of it. There's, it's kind of like why reinvent the wheel? Like it's already there. Um, another thing is, let's say that you, as an individual, your your self perception of what you want to write is like something else. If you're not using the same names, you're not using the the same map. You know, the same visuals. Um, your descriptors may never reveal that it was actually anything to do with a uh, a, a different novel or or a movie or some other fan fiction. You know, um, it, it in sense like it becomes a parallel rather than a uh, an exact copy, uh, where they have a lot of similarities. And like we said before, like history repeats itself normally. Like, and so it's not, I would say it's not uncommon uh, how many Star Trek and Star Wars, you know, like they're close enough, but different enough. And so Can't I think that. that's. You're going you're gonna to start a fight in the comments now? Gosh, dang it. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe we should toss in space balls. And what was that other one that also. Um... Uh, quest. Uh Far quest? Yeah. No, it's yeah. Far quest. Galaxy Quest. Galaxy Quest. Galaxy? Yeah. Far, Far Quest is a great is a is a great show on its own. Uh but <laughs> Yes, Galaxy Quest. Hey, those were those were great. Uh we're talking about parodies of Star Trek. Uh there's a new one that came out relatively recently by Seth MacFarlane. Uh and it is it it's as good as any Enterprise show that's been out there, except for it's just, you know, Seth MacFarlane uh comedy. Uh, so, what's the uh, what what's the 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 movie that came out that like has like the the people who are fighting the uh, like alien uh, insects? It was like we do our part. You, is that Starship Troopers? That's one hundred percent Starship Troopers. Okay, because there's a game that just came out, and I was like, you know, that looks really similar. It's it's, <laughs> it's, it's so it's so great. Uh, the Tell Divers two just came out. All right, so so for the sake of time, so we don't go too much farther over. Um, I'm going to give our star guests a couple minutes to talk. I'm going to do our little pitch at the very end. Uh, and then uh, we will move it and groove it on out of here. So uh, we're going to start with Catherine this time. And then do Paula to finish this off. All right. I just want to tell everybody who's listening. You have your own creativity. Don't let it stop you. Embrace it. Enjoy it. And do what makes you happy. Whatever makes that bubbly spark light the fire inside you that that tells you that you're in the right creative space do it however it comes to you solid now be before you go where can people find you one more time right at it share.com perfect all right paula your turn this is my advice for anybody based on my life and how i've survive the tragedies to create triumphs. I listened to positive words I could trust. I spoke 
positive words others could trust, and I spoke positive words to myself. And I, the positive words to myself allowed me to be creative, and the positive words from others told me how good I was at what I was good at, what I should focus on, and the positive words others can trust can attract unimagined success to you that enhances your creativity and opens doors to new opportunities for creativity. And you can find my all kinds of information about this at softskillstrategycourses.com. Got it. All right. And as usual, those will be in the links uh, for the video itself. So you'll be able to find them easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Uh, for us on our end, our 10% code for the website this month is still love 907 L U V because yep, Unger thinks he's funny. Um, it'll be that for the rest of February. Uh, and then uh, the new code will be in one of our next videos. I mean, heck, I think we'll make it through this next week with uh, love being the code anyway. But that neither here nor there. Thank you guys so much for listening and uh, stick around for the music. And guests don't leave yet. You, we, we have stuff to talk about after this. Wahaha. Ha.